Thank you so much. I have some good news for the group. Um, in this particular lecture, we are not going to learn anything new. So for those of you sitting in the audience saying, whoa, I took the you know, pre-med physics so that I wouldn't have to learn all this electromagnetic stuff. Um, we're not gonna learn anything new. This is learning about how to use energy devices in pediatric patients is actually going to be a way to test what you've already learned. So, I have nothing to disclose. How do I forward here? Here? Oh, there we go. All right. So, um, you can't give the pediatrics lecture in any medical setting without saying that children are not small adults. Um, so if you look at this very small person, she looks a lot like me and actually seems to have um, picked up most of my endearing traits. Um, but if you are operating on her and using an electrosurgical device, she has distinct anatomic and physiologic characteristics that make her different from me or other adults. And you need to take those into consideration when you're using energy devices. So what I'm gonna do in the next few minutes is tell you a little bit about what makes children different anatomically and physiologically. And you can think about situations in which your patients may have anatomic or physiologic derangements that will change how you use energy. For example, some of you may operate on folks who are very edematous and they have more total body water or people with amputations and they have less body surface area and that makes you consider the same things we consider when we operate on children. So, compared with adults, infants and children are going to have a greater body surface area to volume ratio, so more on the outside for what's on the inside, but they have less total body surface area. So that means a couple of things. First, there's less place to put all your stuff, your monitoring devices, your dispersive electrodes, and your work area. It also means that you have tissues of high resistance in close proximity to tissues with low resistance. So how your current is going to behave in the body is going to be very unpredictable. And again, if you are operating on someone with some of these same anatomic or physiologic changes, they have a lot of scar tissue, they have implants, you need to think about those things too. In comparison with adults, infants and children, especially infants, have a lot more total body water. And so as you know, water, tissues with more water are low resistance and they conduct current very well. So if you are operating, an adult has about 60% total body water, a newborn infant has about 75% total body water. And if you're operating on a preterm infant, it's even greater. It can be up to as high as about 83, 85%. So again, the, the tissues are going to conduct water very well and the current can be unpredictable. Children have smaller anatomic structures. That means we're gonna be using smaller instruments. And for those who, of you who do some minimally invasive head and neck surgery or use instruments where you're working in very small places and you're using tiny tips, that concentrates current, more energy, to your anatomic structures. And again, the structures are all very close together, so your risk for inadvertent injury goes up, um, as well as when someone is very small, any injury can be catastrophic. All right, you just heard about fires, and this is a good follow-up to your fire lecture. Um, when you are operating in children with small airways or doing head and neck surgery, again, in a small space, um, you are taking high concentrations, potentially high con concentrations, of oxygen and putting them in close proximity to combustible materials. And if you use something like the coag setting on a monopolar energy device that can create a spark, this is a setup for a fire. So there are a couple of precautions that you can take when you're doing airway procedures, oropharyngeal procedures, or even head and neck surgery in children. This is something, before I took Fuse, I never even thought about this. Now I am almost, I am on high alert every time I'm doing, taking a simple lump or bump off the face of a child. So there's a couple things we can do. Um, if it is an older child, or again, you may have adults who have had airway issues, airway reconstructions where their airways are small, the same principles apply. Um, you can use an endotracheal tube with a cuff to separate your upper and lower airways and keep those high concentrations of oxygen away from the operative field. If you're operating on a child under eight years old, we don't use cuffed endotracheal tubes in those children, but you can make sure that your tube um, 
is appropriate size, so you afford, uh, avoid having a large leak. And then you can avoid using the um, electrosurgical energy devices um, with the high voltage coagulation waveform, your coag waveform, in your patients with cardiopulmonary um, comorbidities that make you use a high concentration of oxygen. And I think this is especially important, again, this is something I never thought about before. I took Fuse, and now any time I am doing a head and neck procedure, I remind the anesthesiologist to be sure that they're using the lowest concentration of oxygen that they can use, and I make sure that I'm using the lowest setting on my devices that I can use to help prevent airway, airway or airway-related fires. Now, let's talk a little bit about electrosurgical energy settings. So this is something that comes up on the exam a lot. What settings do you use? You use the lowest settings you can possibly use to get the desired thermal effect. Um, now, Sharon just told you, what does she use for her settings? She uses 30 and 30. That's what everybody uses. Well, as a pediatric surgeon, I do operate on 500 gram premature infants. I operate on 500 pound teenagers. My standard settings, 12 and 12. I rarely need more. So one of the reasons I went into Fuse is to explore what should I be using on a child, on an infant? What do I use in five kilos? What do I use when I'm operating on a child that's 1,200 grams? Hmm. Well, you know what? There's actually nowhere in the literature that this has been studied. What I have learned in exploring this field is that the maximal recommended settings for a particular weight of a person is going to vary by device and by device manufacturer. And in general, as pediatric surgeons, we use lower settings than people use for adults. What do I usually use for a newborn? I would use 10 and 10. An average term infant, I would use 10 and 10 on my generator settings. For a preterm infant, I will use eight and eight. And for anybody else, again, the couple hundred pound teenagers, I start with 12 and 12. And every so often, if I need a little bit of extra effect, I go up to 15 and 15, but rarely do I have to go higher. And I will say that I would challenge you all to turn down your settings and see, um, and see if you can use them safely, which we do, I do every day in the operating room. Um, if you are using energy devices for um, infants and children, especially in the under five kilogram population, these are things that should be calibrated regularly and they should have stickers on them. And this is just an example of a sticker um, that would go on a machine that would tell you what the maximal recommended settings for a certain weight would be. And um, again, this is something that may not happen in your operating room, but if you start seeing effects that are disturbing, this might be something you want to explore. Dispersive electrodes. So we, do we use the same big Bovi pad that we use in adults? No, we don't. They are available in weight-based sizes for infants and children. The lower limit is about 400 grams or about a pound, and um, adult size can be used when the weight of the patient exceeds about 30 pounds or 13 and a half kilograms. Um, dispersive electrode placement is challenging in children, especially in babies, because again, you don't have a whole lot of surface area to work, and um, and so it's very difficult to um, put all the things you need, your monitoring devices, without overlapping, but it's key not to do that. Um, I will say you have to be very careful with dispersive electrodes. They have the same adhesives that the adult ones do, and neo neonatal skin is extremely fragile, so you have to make sure when you're putting those on and peeling them off um, that you're not hurting the skin. And I have had situations where even though I was operating on a somewhere between 500 and 600 gram infant, uh, premature infant in an emergent situation, and we put the dispersive electrode on and I could not get it to work. I could not get it, I could not get the machine to say that things were okay. And um, you know, what do you do? I, I, this person just came out there liver is not completely working, their coagulation parameters are not gonna be in line and they're sick, so I'm going to need to use some energy. Well, you can use a bipolar device in that situation. Bipolar devices do not require a dispersive electrode and if for some reason you can't get your setup to work, you can always consider that. So where do we put dispersive electrodes in children? For a newborn, for a baby, the preferred site is on the back between your scapula and your sacrum. The rules are the same as in adults. You want a well-vascularized site. You want a site that's convex. You want a site that is away from bony prominences or implants or anything that's too fatty. Um, 
one of the difficult things in children is that almost any, in babies, is that almost any site is at risk for having water or fluids drain onto that dispersive electrode. And as you learned earlier, if that dispersive electrode becomes detached and gets wet, it can become an active electrode and cause a burn. And in an infant, if you have something on the back, you will get a circumferential burn that will kill that child. So um, almost any site is at risk we usually put them on the back, but again, the rules, you wanna make sure you can't cut them, you can't overlap them with other things, you can't put them on leads and cables, and you really have to protect from fluid drainage. And so what I do with babies is I um, use water resistant drapes all around, um, and I call them the dispersive electrode protectors. My nurses and students think I'm crazy, but I'm trying to educate them. Um, and I make it my job to be the protector of the dispersive electrodes, because again, it is almost any site in a baby or a child is at risk for drainage from something that you're irrigating or something that's draining out of the patient, um, and, you can create, uh, and you can create a situation for a burn. All right, finally, our smallest, uh, our youngest and smallest patients are the fetus. Um, and there is no evidence that using electrosurgery in a pregnant woman poses any risk to the fetus at any stage of development, unless you were at a site like we at Vanderbilt where you do fetal surgery and you could possibly directly touch any of your active electrodes to the fetus. Um, the fetus is protected by the um, electrolyte rich amniotic fluid that surrounds it. And as you learned earlier, the output frequency of your electrosurgical energy generators is not at a level that is not going to stimulate muscle contraction, either for the adult patient or for the developing baby. And that's all I have. Thank you.